touch much deeper within Through the way things appear You're looking into my heart I'm coming back to the heart of worship And it's all about you It's all about you, Jesus I'm sorry, Lord, for the things I've made it And it's all about you It's all about you, Jesus King of endless words No one could express How much you do about worship called consumed. Communion is about remembering what God did for us at the cross. His body and blood took away all of our sins, past, present, and future. We worship him because of who he is and what he has done. Let's worship and commune together because our God is an awesome God. can move the mountains let the mountains move we come with expectation we're waiting here for you waiting here for you You're the Lord of all creation, and still you know my heart. You're the author of salvation. You loved us from the start. Waiting here for you.
is and is and is to come. Creation, I sing, praise to the King of Kings. You are my everything, and I will adore you. kingdom that cannot be shaken. Let us be thankful and so worship God acceptably. With reverence and awe. For our God is a consuming fire. Hey, Hope Church, second service. You glad to be here today? Yeah. Amen. Yeah, it's good to see you all. It's also good to have you if you're here online, our virtual guests on our live feed, and we welcome you. We're starting a new series today called Consumed, and uh, we're going to be dealing with the subject of worship. And uh, what is the one thing that God desires above all else from us that we have the freedom either to give or withhold? It's our worship. And all of the other things you said, love and respect and so forth, that's a part of our worship, isn't it? Worship is adoring, expressing love to God. And, and so, so we have freedom. God gives free will. He wants it, but we have the freedom to give it or withhold it. Henry Ward Beecher was a famous preacher who used to have thousands of people flocking to him every week. And uh, one week he decided to take a weekend off. And so a guest speaker showed up to preach. And when he got up on the platform, all at once you could hear the whole crowd go, Ah, and so uh, the guest speaker wisely goes, uh, everyone who is here to worship Henry Ward Beecher, please leave. Everyone who is here to worship the one true God, please stay. See, worship is about God and giving uh, God our love. And we're going to talk about what we do at, at, at when we come together in this series. Now, worship, I believe, is a lifestyle. It's not just something we do down at the church. It's a lifestyle, and we're going to see passages that talk about that. But I want to deal with what we do together when we come together in what is called corporate worship, when we all gather together. What is the one thing that God desires above all else that you and I can give or withhold? It's our worship. And there's this war going on for your worship. There's this war that's been going on actually for a long time. And the war started before we got here on earth. And you saw the war in the garden uh, when the serpent came to Eve and began to tempt them to not obey God and not make God God, but to try to be like God. And in the Old Testament, you read about Lucifer, this created being. Remember, angels are, are, are beings too that have a free will. God gives humans a free will. He gives his created beings a free will, which actually is a sign of God's love. The downside of it is sometimes we can choose to do some bad things and human beings can do some wicked things, but I don't, I don't think that's because God made a mistake. I think it's a display of God's love because he gives human beings free will. Well, Lucifer was a beautiful being. See, one of the struggles when you're beautiful or attractive or very gifted or talented um, or have some position of authority, you can start to think it's about you and forget the giver of the gifts. And that's what happened with Lucifer. He became full of pride, and he wanted, <coughs> excuse me, he wanted to be like God. He wanted to be the object of worship. Look at this passage on your outline in the back of the bulletin. Isaiah 14, 13 and 14. I will ascend to heaven. I will raise my throne above the stars of God. I will sit enthroned in the mount of the assembly. I will ascend above the tops of the clouds. I will make myself like the most high. Do you notice all those I wills? Everybody say I will. I will. I will. I will. I will, I will he says. The fundamental difference between Satan and Jesus is that Satan says, I will, and Jesus came on the earth saying, thy will. Lucifer, or Satan as we know him now, and the writers of the New Testament call him, or the devil, 
He wants you and I to worship Him. Jesus wants you and I to worship the Father in heaven. So there's this war going on for our worship, for your worship. And no one else is worthy of worship than the Lord God. So God called Lucifer, caused him to fall. He cast him down. He's got some freedom for a time, but he's going to end up at the end. We know the end of the story in the big bonfire. And those who are redeemed, who believe in God, who love God, who worship God, will be with him forever. But in the meantime, there is this war. There is this battle. You even see him going after Jesus. And the passage that I have on your outline from Matthew 4, 8 through 9, the devil took Jesus to a very high mountain and showed him all the kingdoms of the world and their splendor. All this I will give you, he said, if you will bow down and worship me. See, he tempts us and, and tries to get us to worship him. And he even has some power and some things that he can offer us, but it's only temporary. What is the one thing that God desires above all else that you and I can either give or withhold? It is our worship. So why is worship so important? What's the big deal with worship? Number one, you are a worshiper. You are a worshiper. Everyone say, I am a worshiper. I am a worshiper. That's right, you are. Even those who don't think they're worshipers, they're worshiping something. And what's really cool, when you see children, it's not hard to teach them to worship. They get into worship. I've told you about my little grandson, who's two, who loves when we do a prayer at dinner. And, and after we say the prayer, Ryder will smile so big, and sometimes he'll say, again, again. He wants to do it again. I want to show you another little one, even younger than Ryder, who, who's worshiping. Check this out. Praise God. Praise God. Hallelujah. Yeah, there you go. Up here. Put it up here. Yeah, there you go. Woo, there you go. Up high. Up high. Yeah, praise God. There we go. Hallelujah. Isn't that awesome? That's baby Jace and his worship leader, Shannon Bruton. You know, um, every rock, every flower, everything created was created to bring glory to God. That brings God purpose. But human beings who have a free will... We have a choice, and we, were, we can worship, and we can adore God, and we can express love to Him. What you give your time to, what you give your energy to, what you give your mind to, what you give your focus to, what you write your checks to, what you schedule in your appointments will give you an idea what you worship. It can be money. You know, money is something we use for an exchange for goods and services. And money's neither good nor bad. We, but it, we can let it become our God. Or it could be if we pay all our bills and we're out of debt and we have it stacked in the bank and we, we can worship that feeling of security. Oh, I finally got security now. There's a lot of very wealthy people who found out they didn't have security when God called their number. And, and I'm not talking about being a good steward. I think we should be a good steward. and because We just don't want it to be our God. There are others who spend money, spend money, spend money. I, I don't have a problem with money. I love to spend it. And, uh, and, and the thrill of spending it can become your God. Throwing it out there on the table and that rush that you get and you worship it. It can be our body, spending hours and hours in the gym, thinking about it all the time, everything, reading, thoughts, trying to, to work on the body, work on the body, having things nipped and tucked and sucked off and just so worried about the body. It can be our clothes, a little bit more, a little bit more, a little more. It can be our kids, something good like our kids. We can all of a sudden be so worried about their soccer and about their dance and about their school and about all these things that we can put them before God. Good things can become our God. They're not bad, they're just not our God. It could be sports, it could be created things like a house, or a couch, or a clean car. Some people have cleaner cars than their hearts. Other people's cars are so dirty, you could put together three Happy Meals. <laughs> but that's another series. It could be relationship, where you put a relationship, you just know God wants you to have this person, and you, you begin to to trust in this person who doesn't want to put God first. And they want you to put them first. 
It can be pleasure. It can be a, a long list of things that we can allow to become our God. And you are a worshiper, and I am an, a, a worshiper. In Exodus 20, God wanted us to know what is right and wrong. And he gave what was called Ten Commandments. The Ten Commandments are that list of thou shalt not, thou shalt not. There was another purpose in the Ten Commandments, was to lead us to Jesus, to show us our need for grace. Because sooner or later, when you read thou shalt not, thou shalt not, you go, oh, but I did. So you need grace. But that doesn't mean the Ten Commandments were a mistake. They weren't a mistake. They are right and pure. In fact, if you look at them, they deal with relationships. Our relationship with God, not having any other gods. Our relationship with others, not stealing, not killing, not having adultery, what hurt, hurts me or hurts other people. It's relationships. That's why I love our mission statement, building relationships that last forever. It's love God, love people. That's the most important thing Jesus said. So, God says this in the Ten Commandments. You shall have no other gods before me. You shall not make for yourself idols. You shall not bow down to them or worship them. For I, the Lord your God, am a, am a what? Am a jealous God. God says, I am a jealous God. What's the one thing God desires above all else that you and I can either give or with, withhold? It is our worship. And the people that he wrote that, when he first wrote that, had a culture around them of idols. And they bowed down to things that they made. And they did horrible things. They had a thing called Moloch, and they would, had like a frying pan with fire underneath, and they would cast their babies on that fire for worship. They committed uh, sex and other stuff as part of their worship. And so the, the believers had this culture around them of idols, and it wasn't easy. You know, you can get sidetracked and start thinking, well, maybe I'm missing out. On, on, the, on these other gods. And I used to work in the Bay Area, and uh, sometimes I would go visit people, and they would have a little altar in their house. And they, they had little idols that they would worship. And we say, ah, oh, that's idolatry. We don't do idol idolatry. But we can do idolatry in another way. Anytime we put anything before God, we worship it, it is idolatry. What do you worship? For me, what I have to watch is pleasure. See, I like to have fun. I want to be happy. And I'm a, what they call a sanguine personality. There's a, they, they say a, a sanguine is an otter. If you've ever read literature where they take certain animals to say, this is what that person is. A phlegmatic is a golden retriever. A choleric is a lion. You know some cholerics. They're the kind of guy that if they want your opinion, they'll give it to you. You know, my way or the highway. Well, a sanguine is an otter. There's a pin uh, a tank up in Oregon that a friend of mine got me a little otter from it, a wooden one. But he said there's a quote on the tank that said, if an otter can't do it and have fun, he won't do it. Now there's nothing wrong with fun. The Bible says God created all things for our enjoyment. When it's bad is when we make that God. When we make pleasure our God. That's been one of my struggles because I want to have fun. I saw my dad die when I was young, man. I, I wanted to suck the juice out of life, and I don't like it when other people around me aren't happy. Everybody's supposed to be happy. Problem with that is that's not how life is where we're always happy. And, and, and you, you, can't, you can't worship happiness or you'll be let down. What do you worship? What are you tempted to worship? You are a worshiper. Number two, you will become like what you worship. That's another reason why worship is so important. We become like what we worship. If we love a God of grace and love and mercy, we become loving and graceful and full of mercy. Look at this quote from uh, Psalm 115. But their idols are silver and gold made by what? The hands of men. Those who make them will be what? Like them. And so will all who trust in them. See, the one thing God seeks that you and I can either give or withhold is our worship. And every one of us is a worshiper, and you become like what you worship. Now, I said that we're going to talk about corporate worship when we gather together. So I want us to think for a moment about what's going on when we gather together for worship. It's an, it's an assembly of uh, people coming together. And you have three things. First, you have the audience if you're a blank filler-outer. 
you have the audience. The audience, you have a lot of power. Because you see, you get to sit there and you get to rank things, kind of like a judge in a diving contest and hold up a card, that was a three, or that was a five, or that was a seven. I don't know about that song. Why is he wearing that shirt? Uh, why are they dressed like that? Uh, I don't know about that song. That sermon was boring. And then you have, so you have the audience, and the next line is, you have the performer. The performer. That's me. I'm the performer. See, I have to entertain you. By the way, entertain is not a bad word when you hear people warring over worship, the war, worship wars, which are arguments of how you're supposed to worship. And everybody thinks they know the way God wants them to worship. And so they have their own style of worship, which is God accepts. And uh, so when they, sometimes they'll say, oh, we're not supposed to have entertainment at church. But when you look at the origin of the word, entertainment means to hold and keep attention, to grab and hold attention. It's funny because some people who don't like a certain style of music because they'll call it entertainment will still rather have an entertaining uh, preacher with a sense of humor than a boring preacher. And so my job's not easy because I'm performing and you're the audience, so I got to grab your attention and make you happy or you won't come and then I won't have a job. So I got to figure out what I can do to grab and hold your attention. The band's got to do what they can do to make you happy. The third thing is the director. The director. Now, the director is supposed to be God. Hopefully, we're up there entertaining you, performing for you, for God. Okay, now what I want you to do is take an X and put it through those three things. What I just said is 100% BS. It is 100% false. It is 100% unbiblical. There is one audience, and the audience is one. The only audience in worship is God. It is not you. It is not me. Only God is the audience. If we have a meeting with someone very important, do we show up all late and lackadaisical? Or once the meeting begins, do we keep chatting and laughing about other stuff, ignoring that those that have started the worship do we do that if God is really there in the middle and the focus? I'm not saying we, I, I'm not trying to put down our friendliness. Don't lose the friendliness. It's a, it's a part of our DNA, and we want this to be the friendliest people in the world. And we believe that everybody who walks through those doors is a gift from God. I'm talking about once the worship has begun, am I really into it, or am I balancing my check? It's okay to write checks, but don't balance your check. Am I filling out my schedule? Am I thinking about what look what they're wearing oh why are they worshiping that way see if god is really the audience that changes everything i don't need to put anything in the plate i got what i came for see i'm a consumer i come to get what i want and then i'm out of there i might even leave early or i'll leave fast because i got what i need i didn't get much out of that people say because we're a consumer. And the goal of this series is for us to be consumed. Our thoughts of other stuff, of lesser stuff, of created things, of human thoughts, all of it to be consumed as we worship God. What is the one thing that God desires above all else that you and I have the ability, the freedom to give or withhold? It is our worship. And every single one of us is a worshiper. We were created to worship. And you become like what you worship. See, my family's not real musical. We love music. You have music going all the time on computers, on TV. We love music. We crank it. But none of us are real gifted in that area. I'm what you call a prison singer. I'm always behind a few bars and can't find the key. <laughs> I'm, a, I'm a baritone. I sing in a tone you have to bear with. And so... That's not my gift. God gives different kinds of gifts. I'm a joyful noise singer. I make a joyful noise. Tim told me we, they left my mic on at first service and my voice was going over the monitors. I know it was torture for the band. They're like, who is that? Who's off? Who's off? Because they're trying to keep it on key and lead us. And so 
You know, the thing is about God, though. See, God, God looks at our heart when we worship. We want, yes, we want to have gifted people because the body should be led by giftedness, not by p- politics or pushy people, but servants who have a certain gift that they use. So we find people to lead up here to help us in our worship that have a gift. Then we have more of a chance being closer on key. So that's why I don't sing or lead. I sing, but I don't lead. When my kids were little, they always would do these performances. Sometimes they were church performances because they were always in church. And uh, so we'd hear them in the, in, in the bathtub. I baptize you in the name of the... <laughs> baptizing their sister or whatever. And one time a cat died and they go, Mommy, Daddy, come out back. We go, okay. So we come walking out back. They're all dressed up. Little Zach's got a little suit on. And, and uh, he's got a little pulpit that I, I gave him once. And uh, he said, we're here for the funeral for our kitty. And uh, they did songs and did a service. And sometimes they did other services that weren't church service. They would just sing or play. When we were sitting there, Tracy and I weren't going, oh, you are so bad. Why don't you get it right? Why don't you sing the one I want? See, it changes everything when you know who the audience is because our Father's looking at us, these diverse people from diverse backgrounds and life experience. And when our hearts unite together, and we worship him, he's like, oh. when we express love to him, when we gather together and we thank God and worship him for the things that he did for us the past week, since the last time we gathered together, our hearts in harmony and unity, that is corporate worship. What is the one thing that you and I can do that God himself desires above all else? And we can either give it or withhold it. It is our worship. What we do is not for people around us. What we do is for God. Now, admittingly, we have a style of music, which is part of worship, not all of worship. We have a style of music that's different than other, some other churches. So that means sometimes someone who likes it in a different way may say, I don't like your worship. I mean, I don't hear people say that to me a lot. They've found out it does no good. But uh, you may hear that sometimes. I don't like your worship. Now, I'm going to give you some permission for something to say. The next time someone says to you, I don't like your worship, you say to them, it wasn't for you. Worship is not for you. It's for God. I love our worship. Sometimes I'll be sitting there and I forget after the last song, after communion, oh heck, I'm supposed to be up there preaching because I'm caught up in it and I love it and I know there's crazy people like me that it helps open up their hearts. But other people worship better or feel more open to another. It's neither right nor wrong. God uses all kinds of churches. What's wrong is when one way says the other way is wrong. God is worshiped in deaf churches. God is worshiped in all kinds of tongues and styles in all countries with all castes and all tribes and all clans and all creation can worship him. And when it's focused on him, God is pleased. So one thing I think to help us in our worship is if we think about who God is and what he has done. When you think about who God is and what he's done in your, I'm talking about in your life, That will help you in your worship. For me, you see, he he created me. He sent his son to die on the cross for my sins, which are many. He put me in a family with a mom and dad who love me, in a country that's the most blessed country in all of history. He he put me in a church with some people that love me, little old gray-headed Bible school teachers who love me and pinch my cheek and hug me and he he let me go to some youth rallies where i sensed his presence and i sang under the stars and i just believed in him and here's what i did as a response i turned my back on him and i became an immoral pleasure seeking party animal not just a party animal the loudest life of the party using my big mouth yeah and if anyone around me wasn't happy with me, I'd punch him in the nose because I want everybody around me to be happy with me. When you go in the life of pleasure, 
unrestrained pleasure, you start doing things like waking up with puke in your hair and looking in the mirror at bloodshot eyes. And sometimes you have wet pants. It's a very humbling thing when you find out you're really not God. And here's what he did. When I was at my lowest point, he says, he, he says I forgive you with unconditional love. And I want you to give your life to me, and here's what I'm going to do. is I'm going to take that loud party animal mouth, and I'm going to have the Word of God come out of it every week. And he gave me a beautiful woman and taught me how, that I have to be faithful. And he gave me these kids and taught me, now you need to be a father and learn how to protect and care for these children. And he gave me a church to work in with people who love me in spite of my weaknesses. They don't have any choice because you become like you worship. They're worshiping God, God's love. They have to love me. And they encourage me. And they help me. And they're my family. And I'm closer to my church family than my close buddies. And I'm very close to people I grew up with. But those who are in the church, I'm closer because we're eternal family of God. That's what he did for me. And he gave me security. I thought it was my four-wheel drive and my cranking Pioneer stereo and that pretty girl and the money in the, in the bank is what gave me security. And I found out I was wrong, but then I found out about him. Oh, Lord, you are my rock. You are my salvation. Like David says, when, my, when mine enemies come upon me, they stumbled and fell. He says, I will fear no one. The Lord is my rock and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? He gave me that security. Now he says you'll have some trials and he'll let us go through some trials. That's part of a fallen world, free will. But in the end, you will live forever and ever and ever with him. That's what he did for me. So my only response, your only reasonable response when you consider who God is and what he's done for you is to worship. I don't mean a little 20-minute get-together or a song, but your life. And your career may not be a pastor. Thank God not everybody's pastors, right? But wherever your career is, you're there to worship God in your life. And your family is a gift from God. And in your neighborhood, you're a life for God. Wherever you are, wherever you live, he didn't make a mistake with you. And in the context that you're in, he is in you and in your life, and you can worship him with your life. Look at Hebrews 12, 28, 29. Since we are receiving a kingdom that what? Cannot be shaken. Security! I finally found it! The chapter says there'll come a time when everything else will be shaken. But we, in Christ, have received a kingdom that cannot be shaken. Let us be thankful and worship God acceptably and reverence with reverence and awe. For our God is a consuming fire. The only thing that God desires above all else that you and I can give or withhold is our worship. And you are a worshiper, and I am a worshiper, and we become like what we worship. And when we consider who God is and what he has done, our only reasonable response is to worship. Now, sometimes that means you fall on your face. Sometimes that means you bust out a song. Sometimes that means you get on your knees. There's no one proper way but it's a natural response to his supernatural greatness. When you watch the Olympics and they have like the gymnasts going on, you know, the beam or whatever, have you ever noticed what happens when someone falls? What does all the audience do? Yeah, you hear this collective, ah, oh, even for people from other countries. That kind of bothers me a little bit. I kind of go, yay, they fell. They're not American. No, I'm just kidding. But uh, you know why people do that? It is a natural response. Someone knows how hard that person has worked and is trying, and the natural response to that natural thing is to go, ah. Well, think about a natural response to a supernatural God. There are times I'm overwhelmed. I'm trying to act like I know what I'm doing, and I don't have a clue. 
and I lay on the floor in my house, say, God help me. That's worship. There are times when I get up to preach and I just don't feel like I studied enough. You're going, oh, we know that. And I, it's been a busy week or maybe I'm tired. I'm just not feeling good. But I pray in my office, come out here and try my best and really rely on this. That is worship. There are times when you've had a bad week, a rough week, and you sing that song and you look at those lyrics and you own them. That is worship. There's times when you're sitting there or standing there physically, you just don't feel good. Your body aches, and you still sing that song, and you look at those lyrics, that is worship. Or you look at someone else, and you share God's love to that person. That's a part of your worship. Whether two or three, wherever two or three gather together, there I am in the midst of you. You see, the reason I want to do this series, I, I, I don't think we're doing bad in our worship. I love our worship. I'm in tears all the time, and I'm happy and thankful, so thankful. But I want to grow. The Bible says in James 4, uh, draw near to me, and I will draw near to you. That's a promise from God. We can say, well, technically God is everywhere. I get that. But James says, but you can grow closer to God, and he will grow closer to you. There's a verse that says, God inhabits the praise of his people. He lives in our songs. Did you know that? So worship is something we can grow in. See, I don't want to just be a church with good music that we go around and a, and a funny pastor, very handsome pastor, just kidding, we don't have that, but a <laughs> overweight, funny pastor, casual guy, comfortable building, real friendly people, where our message becomes the church. Don't get me wrong, I love the church. I love this church. But if we're not careful, we can get the cart before the horse and we can make it all about us, our music, our preaching, our friendliness, our facility. See, our friends, yeah, they need church because God created the church because we need each other, but what they really need is God. And sometimes rather than me just trying to eke them in there with, well, we got great music, people's real friendly and all that good stuff, maybe I just sometimes need to say, you know what you need is God. That's what I need. I desperately need God, and he makes all the difference. So I say, let's, let's don't pat ourselves on the back and act like we've arrived. Let's take it higher, because our God is awesome, and he is a consuming fire. I don't want to be a consumer. When I'm in God's presence, I want to be consumed. And forget about the thoughts. Not lower myself to judging other people. Or being distracted and distracted and I, I have not mastered that I'll just be honest I think I have ADD but we didn't know about that when I was a kid because I'll be think gotta worship gotta worship oh look at that shiny thing you know I, I struggle with it you know I understand I get it I get it and you know what there's a war going on is the truth there is a war going on for your worship and for my worship I say let's be an uninhibited reckless abandoned spirit-filled worshiping church that has only one audience and there's only one rule about how we worship. The rule is there are no rules. The rule is don't judge someone else's servant because you don't know that person's heart. You just focus on the one audience. You're not here to rank. You're not here to criticize. You're not here to be the judge. You're here to worship. That's what God wants. And you know what's really cool when you really worship? You're changed. Have you noticed that? You can be so caught up about some problem or something you're up against or some challenge and you focus on this God who gives us a kingdom that cannot be shaken and how you're in his hands and you go away changed. That's what we talk about, me and Dave, about our worship spilling to the streets. You know, coming in, we're calling men with an upbeat song and it's like calling the people out of the outer courts. It's time to worship and there's hugging and there's rejoicing. I was glad when they said, let us go to the house of the Lord is what the Bible says. It doesn't say I was bored when they said, let us go to the funeral at church. Because I was glad when they said, let us go to the house of the Lord. So we're calling in joyfully, but gradually getting more and more reflective and worshipful until we sit in Abba's lap and have communion. Then we hear Abba's word. And then we have a reflective song about the word of God that we just heard. And then we have an upbeat song because it's time to go out and let our worship spill out into the streets. I say let's don't go and do worship. I say let's show up worshiping.
Amen? Let's don't leave and stop worship. Let's go out worshiping. That's why we're going to have a 24-hour prayer chain. And you'll be, in, you'll be prayed about. You're welcome to join the prayer. We, did, we started this because there's kind of different seasons. You probably figured that out. We didn't have those in the Bay Area. The, the weather was like boring. It was always nice, you know. But here we have seasons. But there's, what I really mean is there's seasons of things going on in your community. Like in the fall, people are going back to school. It's kind of vacation is over. Great time for church growth. And then you have the holidays, family time, relationship time. And then New Year's, great time for church growth. Ramp it up. Then you have spring, oh, Easter's the big day, then summer's coming, and you're like, oh no, I hope everybody doesn't leave. Well, we said, why don't we pray before every season? Instead, I'm just so tired of filling a calendar with my ideas and asking God to bless it. What if we ask God for what he's blessing? Ask God to lead us. So that's what we're going to do in a 24-hour prayer chain. You can join that and sign up. We're praying because we want to ask God to bless Rock the Ridge when we get outside the walls to bless our community. We want to ask God to bless the harvest that we have when we have a safe place for little kids to come on Halloween to get candy and have a good, safe time. We want to pray for all these events because a man makes a plan in his heart, but it is the Lord who establishes his steps. Worship. We want to be a worshiping church. So in view of who God is and what he has done, I bring an offering, and I am the offering. In view of who God is and what he has done, I bring an offering, and I am the offering. What did an offering do when it was placed on the altar before God? What happened to it? It was consumed. Therefore, I urge you, brothers, in view of God's mercy, to offer your bodies as living sacrifices, holy and pleasing to God. This is your spiritual act of worship. From consumers to consumed. Let's pray. Father, I thank you for our church. I thank you for our spirit of worship here. And, and I, I do know there are people here worshiping you, Lord, and that they get it. It's about you. At the same time, Lord, I pray we don't put a ceiling on it. I pray, Lord, that as we grow, that we continue to grow, our message will not become about us, that our message will be about you. You can, you can take any of us out whenever you want. You can raise up new people whenever you want, but it's about you. No one is indispensable, but you are. And uh, so help us to worship with all our hearts and to be focused on you. And we thank you for the salvation that we have by putting our faith in Christ and for the eternal security we have that cannot be taken away. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's all stand together and worship. Yes, I will rise out of these ashes, rise from this trouble I found and the trouble on the ground I will rise Yes, I will rise Out of these ashes, rise From this trouble I found and this trouble on the ground I will rise Cause see Who is in me Is greater than I will ever be And I will rise
out of these ashes rise from this trouble life found in this rubble on the ground that will rise cause see who is in me as great as that now will never be and I will rise Never be and I will rise. Well, I keep on coming to this place that I don't know quite how to face. So I lay down my life in hopes to die. That somehow I might rise. Trouble life, found on the trouble on the ground, I will rise. Yes, I will rise out of these ashes, rise. From the trouble life, found in the trouble on the ground, I will rise. Cause who is in me? As great as that I will never be, and I will rise. Now it's time to pray for our offering. Let's pray. Father, I thank you I get to go to a church that celebrates the idea of giving because I know you love a cheerful giver and, and our life is about making a contribution, not being consumers. Lord, if there's anyone here that doesn't have an income right now financially, help them not to feel guilty or ashamed, but to just give their heart to you because that's what you want most and the others will fall. But those of us who have an income, Lord, I pray we'll give as the New Testament says, as we prosper, our giving will grow, that we will be a force of hope on the ridge and beyond till Jesus comes. Please help us in that, and I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. amen. Hey, before we give, what is our purpose? Building Amen. amen. So remember, till next week, in Christ we always have hope. Amen. Thanks for being here. Before me, the world behind the only yeah, faith. It's not for me, it's all for you. Let the heavens shake and split the sky. Let the people clap their hands and cry. It's not for us, it's all for you. To your name be the glory, not to us, to your name be the glory. Send your holy fire on the sovereign, let our worship burn for the world to see. It's not for us, it's all for you.
waves are crashing, the sun is raging down to you. The universe is spinning, singing, it's all for you. The children are dancing and dancing. And that is how you mess up a song. <laughs> Have a wonderful week.